right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for your coming. So today, so we are very excited to have uh, Professor Zhou so from University of Oregon. So you know what? So we have a beautiful weather here today. And in general, so we have a beautiful uh, climate here. And so, but uh, Professor Zhou, he's gonna talk about uh, pollution. Um, and that's quite important, particularly given the climate change discussion. Right, uh, so Eric, so you have uh, one hour. Uh, so okay. we may or may not have questions. So we may just stop at some point, right? And yeah. so, yeah, so we will have some like a, a Q and A toward the end. Uh, thank you so much for your time. So right. let me start thank sharing you. and then so you can share your uh, slides with us, right? Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, I'll try to share my screen. You see it? Yes, yeah, coming. Yeah, great. All right. Uh, let's try to see if I can do it. Do you see the full screen? Yeah, so you have uh, quite uh, amazing co authors. <laughs> great, thanks. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, especially Zhigang. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Zhigang was my uh, macroeconomic professor when I was at Illinois, one of my best professors at Illinois. Uh, this is like, six years since I've seen him, uh, he doesn't appear to age. I don't know, like, what's your secret? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I'm so, going to talk about pollution. So yeah, I right. to talk this from talk to small to value of pollution information. So uh, again, I'm Eric Zhu, uh, student professor at the University of Oregon Econ Economic Department. So this work is uh, joined with Pamela Job Barwick and Shandrin Lee at Cornell University. So this is basically the work uh, while I was doing postdoc with them. Uh, and also with Li Guo Ling at Shanghai University of Finance and Economics. Uh, that's one of the best universities in, uh, in my hometown. All right, so big picture motivation, uh, I think perfect information is important for efficient decision making, both you know, private and public. Uh, but in real world settings, uh, information is often costly to obtain, right? So if you think about like nutritional contents, occupational safety, some taxation, even returns to education, a lot of context information is uh, costly and hard to get. Right? So what we focus on this paper is the context of air pollution exposure, uh, not only because I do air pollution research, but I also think there are two uh, things that make it important. One is that in pollution information, pollution is very low salient, right? So a lot of pollutants are often colorless and they don't have smell, so it's hard to, to feel. And the two is that uh, about limited access, right? So if you look at the 20 countries we know uh, that have the highest level of PM2.5, only four of them uh, that have any format of pollution monitoring or monitoring infrastructure. Just to give an impression of uh, how kind of bad the, uh, the problem is uh, in China. So this is a picture, uh, I think of a Northern city in China in 2011, uh, November 27. Uh, what's called a major fog event, right? And you can see the picture, it's the middle of the day, you can't see the sun. And uh, this is how the, the event is reported by uh, the official news media, right? So it says, here's the kind of the, you know, Chinese translation, uh, dense fog causes traffic congestion in many Northern cities, all right? So a lot of these type of events, especially in the winter are reported as like fog events. Now the question is, is this really fog or is this really pollution? So here is a satellite picture of Northern China. Now you don't need to know a lot about, you know, satellite imageries to know, uh, you know, just look at this kind of blanket of grayish stuff uh, hanging around the middle uh, or Northern part of, of China. And actually, uh, if you look at satellite, you know, measures of pollution. So the uh, measure here I use is called aerosol optical depth it's kind of measuring how opaque the air is from the satellite point of view. So larger values respond to more particular pollution, like small particles in the air. And in this figure, you can see the value is really high, right? So near five, just to give, it, to give you a perspective, in the US, the average, on an average day, uh, the AOD level is something like 0.13, right? So this number is off the scale. It's uh, obviously pollution events rather than uh, a fog event. Right. So I think this reflects a kind of widespread confusion uh, in China, uh, at least 10 years ago. Uh, so here is a quote from Chai Jing. Uh, Chai Jing is a 
you know, environmentalist turned journalist. And she has this very famous documentary called Under the Dome, millions and millions of viewership uh, on, in you know, China media. So what she basically said is that we all believed, you know, as, as a journalist and, and public that that was fog back then. Right? So that's what we call it. I never thought the skies that we see every day could be polluted. I always thought pollution is about mining sites and factory like spewing smoke rooms, right? All right, so what we're gonna do today is that we're gonna think about this type of, uh, you know, the, the, the lack of information and the consequences of uh, people don't have availability of ready uh, sort of access to pollution information. So what, what we are gonna actually do in this paper is that we're gonna study China's national air quality monitoring and disclosure program. Right? So the first thing is that uh, there's no public access to pollution data before this program. Uh, so pollution was considered before this program, a kind of sovereign issues. So you're not supposed to, I mean, you can, you can say that pollution looks bad, you're not gonna get arrested or something like that. But if you wanna start a campaign then start to tell everybody how bad exactly pollution is, you're very, very likely run into trouble, right? But starting January, 2013, uh, I'm gonna talk about background, but there's a kind of a watershed moment where the government changed its attitude and towards kind of more transparent pollution disclosure. So what they do is that they kind of mimic the US government and installed over 1400 monitoring sites all across the country, right? So these are US like environmental protection agency grade kind of monitors. They're all automatic. Uh, the data, when they're collected from monitors, are transmitted in real time to the government website. And uh, what's important that, uh, is that not only they kind of sort of collect the data and give it to the government website, they also allow private entities like companies to scrape the data directly from the website, right? So what you see then is a explosion of like mobile apps and stuff uh, came online that broadcast sort of real-time air pollution to, to residents, right? So this is kind of the treatment we're gonna use. And, uh, you know, just give an idea what the website looks like. So you don't have to know Chinese to, to read this. So this is the map of China, a dot here is a city. Uh, you know, red dots are places with high pollution and green dots are places with low pollution. You can click on any dot here, which will give you, you know, hour by hour record of air pollution in a given city. Uh, you can look at any city, any pollution, right? And, uh, you know, I, I don't think this is a real treatment to the extent that my mom is not gonna log onto this website and click through. Uh, I think the really important thing uh, shown here is the mobile app, right? So after 2013, this program start to, to roll out. Um, you start to be able to download this type of apps on your mobile phone that tells you, for example, here that in Shanghai, now uh, the air pollution index in Shanghai is about 101. It's called moderately polluted. Uh, and it shows you exactly constant, what is the concentration of particular pollution, All right? So that's basically why my mom is talking about like eight hour ozone these days, right? So great improvement in awareness. And what's uh, also very useful for the research uh, perspective is that this program is very large. It's not installed like all at once. So there is a staggered rollout of monitoring across three waves of cities, right? So some cities get the monitoring network, get disclosure before other city did. So that gives us sort of quasi experimental variation to, to look at the impact of the program, all right? So uh, here is how the program basically roll out. Uh, I'm gonna talk about, so um, the dark color here are cities that get the monitoring first. The sort of you know, light blue color or the middle light blue color is they got in the second wave and the third wave, the rest of the country. Uh, and basically the, the rollout schedule follows a pre kind of determined city hierarchy way I'm gonna talk about later giving us sort of quasi uh, exogenous variations seeing when do the city get the, get the monitoring and data, right? So Eric. Yeah. Quick question. So if I just eyeballing, so this picture, it seems like they roll out in relatively wealthier part of the country, but this is related to the uh, question. So maybe just go back to the previous slides. I guess yeah. you probably have a question. So here, so one question you are interested in, so is that information provision or 
uh, altered awareness, behavior, and health. Right. So my feeling is uh, here, so it really you requires the uh, citizens, so they are educated in some sense. Right. Yeah, and definitely. Not, like, um, I'm sorry. Right. Sorry. Yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, you're, you're totally right. Uh, and so here uh, you can see that uh, all of the cities that you can name in China, like Beijing or Shanghai, Chengdu, they got the monitoring first. So right. there's definitely sort of which city got monitoring uh, first in terms of like which hierarchy it is. Like uh, most of the city actually get the first wave if they are a first kind of hierarchy city, like tier one or tier two cities. Uh, but the type of variation what we're going to use though is sort of like at this month when the city starts to broadcast pollution, let's look at sort of shortly before versus after that city starts to publish in data. What do we see uh, in terms of behavior and health change as a function of the time when a city uh, starts to sort of have pollution information? And we do have like stack rollout. So at some period when Beijing is getting, uh, for example, pollution data, the nearby city like Shu Jiazhuang, it doesn't have it, right? So this is also a second layer so variation we use, which is geographic variation. But I'm gonna show you in later when I present the results that the primary source of variation, I think of it as the, the, the exact month when, for example, the January 2013, when Beijing starts to, to publish air pollution data, what happens to uh, the Beijing citizen in terms of their behavior before versus after they start publishing the data. Okay, so maybe, maybe I want to uh, elaborate a little bit uh, on my question. So right. my concern is, my concern is you think about, so the governments when they roll out the program, right. and so the, the government like strategically decide where they're gonna roll out. So basically, so they are going to roll out in a city. So they understood or they anticipate uh, the awareness of pollution is much higher or much, uh, so they have much more uh, uh, pollution aware citizen. Right. So, right, so in other words, if they do not roll out in that city, so they are going to get backfire or get uh, 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 unhappiness, whatever. So in that sense, maybe your results is kind of, you see what I'm saying, right? So they just like for looking like a rational expectation. So, I roll out in that particular city because they're new. So the city there, if they don't, uh, if I don't roll out uh, the information or don't roll out the uh, monitoring, so they are going to get angry or whatever. So, so you see my point, right? Yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, I think um, there's definitely like the government do want to, I mean, there is a reason they don't kind of roll out the program first sort of in the, in the least kind of wealthy or informational disadvantaged like cities, right? So they wanna kind of do the pilot in a city where people do have the knowledge background to understand what pollution is once you give them the data. In terms of whether like people are gonna change, I, I think your question boils down to this, like are people going to change their behavior anyways? Uh, like even if you don't give them the information, right? Otherwise like, um, you know, so if, all I, I'm looking at is the variation coming from when you have no data access before to when you have data access. And I'm gonna show you the entire causal chain for the same kind of representative citizen in Beijing. What happens when pollution was high, when he does not know pollution levels, how does that translate into behavioral changes? I'm gonna show the elasticity, basically responsiveness is very low, right? But after the kind of, uh, you have the information, the same amount of pollution variation is gonna cause us a larger response for the same citizens in Beijing, right? So the, so the variation is coming from the before versus after the people have data access. I think I don't, I don't get your like rational expectation question exactly like what you're worried about, but let me show you the results and see if your concerns st is still there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so uh, the key research question we're gonna ask in this paper is does information provision alter stuff like awareness, behavior, and health? And ultimately what we wanna get at is the value of providing people with uh, this type of pollution information. Okay, so a roadmap of, uh, of this paper, how we're gonna do this. Again, uh, we're gonna show you uh, when information changes, how does things change on this causal chain? 
So we're going to first do is that we're going to first characterize uh, the sea change in information access and awareness, basically tell you what the treatment is, right? So I'm going to show you two pieces of evidence. First is that there is actually increased in information access in terms of like mass media pollution information coverage, right? So the media talk about pollution more. Two is I'm going to show you increased awareness, right? So actually when you, when people have higher access to pollution information, they actually, the demand for, uh, for pollution information also increase. I'm going to use web searches on pollution related topics uh, to show you that. So that's the first part. The second part of paper analyzes the role of information in basically shaping this F function, which is the mapping between pollution and outcome. All right, so there's a huge literature out there that estimates the causal effect of pollution and outcome. Uh, stuff like increased avoidance, people have shown that when pollution is higher, uh, outdoor activities decreases. But what we are interested in this paper is not this elasticity itself, but how does that elasticity, how do people, the way that people respond to pollution changes before versus after they start to have information, right? So we look at uh, increase in avoidance. We're gonna look at capitalization, which is a relationship between pollution and housing value, right? So where do people choose to live in a cleaner or, uh, or dirty neighborhood? And then we're gonna look at ultimately health damages, right? So for the same amount of increase in pollution, how does mortality rate your health outcome changes as a function of availability of information? So the key challenge of this project, of course, is that you don't get to observe pollution until the government start to monitor it, right? So uh, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna use a consistent measure of pollution, both before and after data availability. Uh, so we're gonna draw data from the satellite. Uh, this is MODIS aerosol optical jet, which is the picture I showed you earlier on the Northern part of China. So the nice thing about this measure is available uh, since 2004, I guess. So it's like way before uh, the, 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 the Chinese government started to monitor, right? So the measurement has been always been there. Okay, I hope it's clear like what I'm trying to do in this paper. Uh, and let me jump in to, to show you what uh, the first part. So the first part of the paper is basically telling you uh, what, the, what the treatment is. So we're gonna document a sharp change in information after city began broadcasting pollution. Uh, so I basically gonna show you two examples. Think about that as a, like one is the you know, old fashioned of getting information. The other is like new fashion of getting information. Like the old fashioned way is newspaper mentions of air pollution. So we scrape data of all the articles ever published in People's Daily. Uh, you know, all the way back to 1990. So People's Daily is the official newspaper of the, of the, the government. You're supposed to read that. Uh, and so on the y-axis, I show you the number of daily issues. You know, there are 30 issues in a month. I show the number of days with any small mentions, either in the news titles or in the news articles, right? So, um, what you see here is that the, the word smog, so we've also tried other words like air pollution or atmospheric pollution, but the frequency of these terms are basically zero uh, in the 1990s or 2000s. A little bit of a pickup in the early 2010, and then just uh, starting the month of 2013, you see a huge jump in terms of the frequency, right? So after 2013, basically the topic of smog became from you know, from a weekly topic basically to uh, nearly a daily topic. Now this is only showing you a pure time series. A lot of things can happen before versus after 2013. So what we can also do is that we text mine the, uh, every articles we scrape and we look at the list of cities that it mentions, right? And then what we do is that we use that kind of list of city mentions to build a panel data of at the city and daily level. Right. And then what we can do is I can show an event study, which is on the y-axis is a standardized, you know, mean zero standard deviation one, smog news mentions as a function of time, which is quarters, relative to the, when a city began monitoring. All right, so zero is the time when uh, the city began to have monitoring data. So for Beijing is January, 2013. And for places near Beijing like Shijiazhuang, it's like uh, October, 2000. Uh, 2013, right? So you, basically you have a staggered event study. So what you can see here is again, the standardized smog news mentions is uh, close to zero before and an increase to something like uh, by about 0.5 standard deviation uh, after uh, after the intervention. So, so it's after the city have information, 
there are a lot more news articles that mention smog and also that particular city. Your question? Yes. So here, so I was just wondering, so do you have any measure regarding to how the citizens, so they receive the, the news or they really read the news? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share it later. So okay. I can't know exactly like whether people read the uh, people's daily like readership, but like that article, but I can show you, for example, web searches, people do like inquire sort of information about air pollution much more when the city starts monitoring. Good, thanks. Something like that. Yeah. But for the first part, we're gonna, we're only looking at access, which is like, are there more sort of information availability, uh, you know, of pollution if people wanna get it, right? Okay, so that was the old fashioned way of reading newspaper. The new fashioned way is mobile app, right? So this is data from uh, Apple's API, the China version of Apple API. So what I'm showing you here is the distribution of the time uh, when uh, pollution related apps are related, right? Uh, which is a blue line uh, versus the distribution of, uh, of release time of other apps. So you can see that by the time that I scraped the data, which is December, 2015, uh, you can see there's a huge jump around 2013, January, when uh, a lot of apps starts to incorporate air pollution data, right? So that's, a, uh, that's an increase relative to the rest of other like apps, things like gaming or music or video or reading or finance. Um, and you might have some question like, why do, do you have sort of apps uh, about air pollution right before 2013 when no pollution data has been available. We actually dig into what these apps are. Now it turns out these are weather apps. So they used to only report like temperature and precipitation that later incorporated uh, pollution information as of December, 2015, right? So anyway, this is like technical detail, but I'm, what I am showing you here primarily is the fact that uh, you have a, a very large increase in the den, uh, in availability of pollution related mobile apps after 2013. All right, so that is access. And now I'm gonna speak to uh, Chigong's question on do people actually, you know, now you have increased access to actually, people actually uh, take that into account when they, when, you know, you know uh, sort of pick that up um, after 2013. So what I'm gonna do here is looking at awareness and the way we're going to capture that is we're going to examine changes in web searches on smog related topics after a city began monitoring, right? So uh, smog is, why do we use smog? Again, smog is a buzzword for, uh, for, for pollution. Uh, if you have Chinese audience like uh, the, the, the exact Chinese term we use is umai, which is a uh, Chinese version for, uh, for, for, for smog. And, so the data we have is city by weekly web searches from Baidu.com. Baidu is like, uh, it's the Google of China. Uh, it's like, you know, it's the go-to search engine in China. Uh, and it, so the, so the Baidu search index is just like Google Trends. It measures the intensity of searches for a particular term, smog in this case, relative to the search intensity for all other uh, topics at the same week uh, for, the, for the same city, right? So it's measure intensity. So here uh, I'm showing you two panels. Uh, this is just uh, the kind of analog of the two figures I showed you earlier. The left hand side is a pure time series. It's search index, the raw and adjusted search index as a function of absolute time. Right? So starting in 2011 to end of 2015. And again, you can see this like magnitudes, orders of magnitude increase in search index uh, for smog starting January, 2013. And on the right-hand side, we sort of disaggregated data to the city uh, by quarter level. So this is, we know for each city uh, in each quarter, when do they, uh, you know, how much, what's the intensity of search for smog. So this is showing a standardized search, smog search as a function of time, again, relative to the city begin, uh, begin data broadcasting, right? So what you can see again, is that it hovers around zero before and it jumps by again about a 0.5 standard deviation after the city began broadcasting pollution. Right? So not only pollution access increase, but people are searching about pollution stuff more. Right? So you might think that uh, you know searches for pollution is just you know one proxy. Uh, they don't necessarily have to do anything, even if they search. Uh, so what we do is that we also collect data. Uh, I think this is for 50 cities, the best we can do. 
uh, this is actual sales of air purifiers, all right? So these are like um, kind of uh, 50 or $60 uh, kind of keypad monitors, sorry, keypad air purifiers that you can put in home uh, that filters the air. And uh, we have data since uh, 2012. Uh, again, you can see kind of a mirror image uh, for, you know, from a previous slide. You, show, uh, you see that the, uh, the sales of air purifiers jump almost double uh, since January 2013 when the program began. On the left-hand side and the right-hand side, again, I'm looking, uh, I'm showing you the uh, event study plot, right? So the log per capita air purifier sales jumps up uh, exactly when the city began publishing air quality data. Okay. So I've shown you uh, access, I've shown awareness. Uh, now I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, go to how does the information availability changes behavior. Now, before I do that, because a lot of pieces, I'm gonna talk about you know, avoidance, I'm gonna talk about things like uh, residential choice and health. So uh, I'm gonna show you a like simple four line models that stitch everything together, right? So think of that, about that as a conceptual framework. So we're gonna have a very simple model uh, that starts with a classic Becker uh, Grossman health production function. And then we're gonna add two layers to it, right? The first layer is that we're gonna allow agent to act to avert pollution's health damage. This is following the previous literature on avoidance behavior. And also we're gonna allow agents perceived pollution level to actually differ from the actual pollution they experience. Okay, so uh, again, a four line model. Uh, first, we're gonna have a health production function. So the health H is gonna depend upon pollution uh, C, which is the outdoor air pollution concentration, and A, which is uh, avoidance behavior, things like staying indoors or defensive investments or residential choices. So the key component of our model is that we are gonna allow agents to have their perceived pollution to differ, potentially differ, from the actual pollution, right? So people make decision based on the uh, ex ante perceived level of pollution C, but their actual health is gonna depend upon the ex post uh, sort of actual pollution exposure, right? Now what you can show, uh, show under common like regularity conditions of the utility and health production function is that a utility maximizing individuals is gonna exhibit uh, avoidance behavior, right? So when pollution increases, to show that A or things like air purifier or air mask purchases are going to increase. And finally, uh, we're going to assume that the monitoring program eliminates the information wedge. So we're going to assume that before monitoring, the agents uh, underestimates either level of pollution or the damage uh, of the, that level of pollution. Uh, and after monitoring, the information wedge is eliminated. All right, so from this kind of four line models, uh, we can derive two main sort of predictions that we carry to the data. The first is that after the, pro, uh, the, the information program, we predict that the avoidance behavior, the amount of avoidance behavior we see is gonna increase. And the second empirical prediction is that the same amount of pollution exposure does less harm to health after people uh, get uh, in pollution information, right? So uh, what are we gonna do next is that we're gonna quantify that uh, something we call the value of pollution information. Uh, you can derive that from the first order condition, which is the direct utility gain from being able to know the data, the wage increases minus the avoidance cost, things like you know, the money you have to spend to, to buy air purifiers and stuff. We're gonna be measured the utility uh, parts and avoidance parts. We're gonna also talk a little bit about implementation. And then at the end of the day, I'm gonna tell you whether the information program appears to be worth it to, uh, to implement given the utility sort of health improvement and avoidance cost. So Eric. Yeah. So one more question. So I understand this is a short talk, so you cannot go to the detail of the, of the, of the model. Yeah. So quickly, so here, so you do not consider like, uh, I mean, in my language, like a general equilibrium effect. So for example, you do not consider so how my behavior is gonna change in terms of creating pollution? Right. So, but- right. Exactly. Is, I just wondering, so how, how important is that? Right. So I, I think you're, you're totally right. So like after people start to have uh, kind of pollution information, that might actually not only, for example, they might uh, go outdoor less, 
And what cares with that is that you use private vehicle as the things like that, right? And then uh, that can sort of in turn changes that level of pollution and you have this loop, right? So like um, after monitoring, you can change the pollution levels. So, uh, I, but, you know, so the, again, the model is sort of a conceptual framework. Uh, we don't intend to capture everything. It's, it's sort of like a minimum amount of sort of mathematical structure that you need uh, to, to generate an empirical prediction. But we actually look at the data to see if the monitoring program itself has improved air quality. This is something we can actually see in the data. Um, so what we found is that if you look at air quality, the general level of air quality, things uh, in China since 2013, uh, you know, many of you may not know, but since 2013, the air quality in China has improved by something like 40%, right? So a like dramatic increase, uh, part of because of a lot of other regulations that the government is implementing. Um, you know, I didn't mention that part of the reason that I started mention, sort of monitoring air pollution is that they have like five year kind of uh, plans to, they want to install to kind of improve air quality. And the first thing, of course, you have to monitor them. So, um, Except for like, if you parse out the general declining, like the overall trend of air pollution, the monitoring program itself, right, so conditional on the time trends of the general decline of air, of air pollution, the, the monitoring program itself doesn't change air, air quality. Right? So it's not true that uh, once they start to in, uh, implement air uh, implement the data sort of disclosure program, the air quality changes as a consequence of that. At least we cannot detect that from the data. So uh, that's partly the rationale that we shut down that kind of feedback in, in the model. Does that partially answer your question? Uh, I guess so. Again, so maybe my question is just uh, too lousy because because uh, this is just too complicated. So the yeah. other thing I want to mention is in the morning, I was reading uh, these issues of economies. Mm -hmm. So basically, you can see there's like a divergence in terms of government's, uh, um, government's uh, reaction or opinion regarding to climate change. Yeah. Like you know, Japan and uh, China, they, they decide to go to like uh, uh, carbon free or emission free in like right. mid 2050. Yeah. But the US seems like go to the uh, uh, different direction, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so you see my point, right? So, the, certainly, so this awareness is going to change. Okay, I don't know. So, it's probably just too complicated because, uh, yeah, yeah. I like, think a lot of that uh, awareness, one thing, the other is people's attitude, right? So, like, you can be perfectly aware of the, the issue, but you don't think it matters or you don't think it is important. And that could be influenced also by like um, general political or like public opinion sort of environment. Um, yeah, that is totally true. Yeah, thanks. Yes, yeah, please go. Okay, okay yeah, thank thanks. You. Right, so, um, so, so much for, uh, for the conceptual framework. So now I'm gonna, tell you a little bit more about how do we carry those things? How do we um, sort of implement that empirically? So uh, basically, to put in the simplest term, we're going to basically estimate the change in the slope, right? So what we're going to do down to the ground is that we're going to regress the outcome, let's say avoidance or you know health at a city C on week T on a measure of a pollution on that city NT. And we're going to look at the interaction which is the, the, the pollution and the information W, all right? So basically how to interpret beta, the interpretation is basically the, the change in the correlation between pollution and outcome before and after the program, right? So before the program implementation, you have a correlation between pollution and outcome. After uh, the information program, you have a different pollution and outcome correlation and the beta is estimated the difference between those two correlations. Right. And uh, so why is that different from the existing literature? Uh, the existing literature basically is focusing on estimating correctly beta, right? Which is the effect of pollution. So if pollution increasing by unit, how does that change outcome? And there's a big like a causal effect literature on that. And here we focus on beta, which is a change in the slope due to information program. And the question of course, is how do you get a consistent estimate of beta, right? Uh, and so we show in the paper that you have to satisfy two assumptions in order to estimate a beta causally without having to estimate an alpha causally, right? So I'm gonna, let me walk you through those two conditions. One is that again, we uh, require the treatment dummy, which is the information D dummy for the, the role of the program. 
has to be exogenous, right? So conditional on my control axis, the epsilon have to be orthogonal to, to, um, to the treatment. So we have two piece of, pieces of empirical support to that. The first is that the program rollout is largely determined by city's administrative hierarchy, right? And these hierarchies are determined like in the 1980s or things like that. So just let me show you this picture again. Uh, the, the, the cities that get the, the rollout first are the cities in the, in the highest sort of hierarchy, uh, the tiers. And the way to visualize those is I make this table. Uh, and you know, what you can see here is, I mean, it's hard to explain, but basically what it says is that if the policy is really implemented as it does, which is the tier one city should be, uh, wave one city should be provincial capitals, the Jinjinji area, the Yangtze River Delta, the Pearl River Delta. The river two is the 2007 National Improvement Priority List, the 1997-2012 National Environment Protection Exemplary Cities, and wave three is the rest of the city. If the policy is actually implemented by these like predetermined hierarchies, you would have seen dark blue in all of the wave one cities, light blue in all of the wave two cities, and all white in wave three. The actual implementation has some kind of a deviation from the plan, sort of the, you know, what they say they want, they are going to do, but the deviation is not very large. Uh, and what we do in a paper in the robustness check is that we also kind of restrict to the city where they fall in the correct kind of cubic, right? And basically what uh, the, the takeaway here is that the, the determination of the rollout waves are determined by pre-designated things like which cities are provincial capitals or what are Jinjin G rather than by stuff like the pollution levels or, or things like that. Okay. Uh, and I think, so that's only just one kind of justification. And I think the most powerful thing is uh, basically the parallel trends test, right? So what you wanna see is that there's no pre-trend in the beta estimates, right? In the pre-period, followed by a sizable break at the time of the treatment, okay? So basically once you, you know, condition all your controls, uh, the beta is gonna behave very stably uh, until the, the, the treatment kicks in when it changes its level, okay? So that's the first set of assumption it has to, uh, it has to satisfy, which is the, the traditional kind of exogenity assumption. The two is that in order for the interaction beta term to be causal, uh, we derive uh, in a paper, uh, there's proof in the appendix that the treatment has to be in independent of the pollution level itself, right? So conditional on the controls, uh, it, it has to be true that the treatment doesn't change the level of pollution itself. This is actually what uh, Ji Gang, uh, Ji Gang uh, pointed to earlier. Uh, and we actually, again, tested in the data. So let's look at the blue kind of cells. So we regress uh, pollution or log pollution and the indicators for, uh, for before versus after uh, sort of program, controlling for stuff like overall trends in, uh, in pollution, like a city, week of year level. So um, column one is our kind of the most uh, lenient specification where we have city, week of year fixed effects and year fixed effects. We gradually phase in more kind of uh, streaming fixed effects. You know, in, in column four, we have city fixed fix effects and region by week of sample fixed effects, right? And across the column, we see a very small coefficient, right? So like after, for example, the information program, you see pollution increases in the, uh, by only 0.15%, something like that, right? Okay. Uh, let's see what I'm going to talk about. All right, so the pr proposition in the paper uh, is that the OLS estimate of the beta is going to be consistent as long as assumption one uh, and two are satisfied, even if the level in, in alpha is not. And we provide a intuition sort of the appendix, which is basically think about as uh, the bias in the slope uh, estimates the pre versus post uh, treatment is going to cancel out once you have these two conditions being satisfied. Okay, I guess I you know from this on you can you can forget about the technical technicality because uh, we're gonna we're gonna do things uh, in graphs and things are gonna be clear. Um, so how are we gonna do this uh, implementation wise? So we're gonna have city by weekly level data from January two thousand eleven to April two thousand sixteen. Uh, for mortality, you actually have data until December two thousand sixteen. So I can show you longer post period. So I'm gonna show you for every outcome event study. 
uh, of beta, the coefficient. I'm going to show you table reports point estimates. Excuse me. I'm going to show you the same set of specification fixed effects changes for uh, for robustness and make cluster standard errors at the steady level. Um, and one exception, so all the outcome and examine, I'm going to show you the same set of specifications. Uh, one exception is for housing transaction data, which we only have for the city of Beijing, but estimation equation is going to closely mirror the one above, right? So, so Eric, so gamma, so that's essentially, what is ga gamma is? Uh... Right, so X gamma here is just like a control matrix. Think of uh, this as like uh, city fixed effects, right? Like and then you have like block. a here and the gammas are just the coefficients of the fixed uh, Sorry, effects. so X prime, so includes a what? Oh, uh, it includes, so uh, I'm gonna show you tables, but basically it includes things like city fixed effects, week of year fixed effects and year fixed effects, in, uh, and also other stuff that could be correlated with both pollution and outcome, uh, including things like temperature and precipitation. No, so actually, so what I was interested in, this is just a uh, circle back in my earlier concern. So yeah. I was uh, thinking, so X, you probably need to include like uh, education, income, and even you probably need to include like industrial policy in that city. Right, so anything that changes at the, at the city year level, for example, if you think that uh, things like uh, the average level of income and education in the city and year is gonna differ, right? Uh, that is absorbed by things like city by year fixed effects. We're gonna have those, yeah. Oh, okay, so you, okay, so you consider that. Yeah, yeah. But so do you consider like different cities so they have different industrial policy. Let's say for example, some city really relies on those industry, but that industry is pretty like a pollution hairy. Right, so uh, definitely like uh, if you, so we have, we're gonna have city fixed effects. So anything that is different across different cities are getting absorbed, right? So our city A has larger fraction of mining relative to city B, uh, right. that's gonna be absorbed by city fixed effects. So the only thing that I say would uh, kind of you know, confound the beta coefficient is going to be things that correlate systematically with the rollout of the program. For example, if there is a program that uh, also kind of change industry policies for the same set of wave one cities, exactly at January 2013, that type of thing is going to uh, sort of uh, confound the beta estimate. If a, if a policy that only changes sort of at the year level, Right, so it's just like Beijing 2013 and 14 is different, but it's not systematically correlated with the way that a policy rollouts across the nation. It's not going to matter because it's absorbed in the fixed effects controls. Okay, thank you so much. Right, yeah. And we discussed in the paper, we searched like meticulously for, for any policy that could potentially correlate with the rollout. Uh, and we consider, I think, four or five of them that can potentially be kind of correlated, and we don't find evidence. And the other thing is, I think, like any industry policy that matters for pollution, very likely is going to change the level of pollution, right? So if you control emission for a different city, or if you, if you give like subsidy to a different uh, for given industries, uh, if it's pollution heavy, that probably is going to change the pollution level, either up or down. And uh, a part of the evidence we found earlier is that we actually don't see that sort of a pollution uh, level changes as a function of the program itself. Okay, so uh, let me see, I have like 15 minutes left. Maybe enough to, to walk you through briefly the results. So um, the first part, uh, let me show you again the, the roadmap. The first we're gonna look at avoidance and then we're gonna look at capitalization, which is like, think of it. So think about uh, avoidance outdoor activities as kind of a short run a short-term way to avoid pollution. Housing value, think about that as the long run, sort of long-term way to avoid pollution and think of a mortality as the ultimate outcome that we care about. Okay, so for short-term uh, avoidance, we're gonna analyze the relationship between pollution and outdoor activities. Uh, again, we're not interested in how outdoor activity itself respond to, to uh, pollution but we are interested in how changes in the low loss coefficient between outdoor activity and pollution as a consequence of the intervention program. Now, how do we measure outdoor activities? So we have data from the universe of credit and debit card transactions in China between 2011 and 2016. 16. 
So we have administrative, da administrative data from Union Pay. Union Pay is the only card transaction clearing house in China. So as long as you swipe a credit or debit card in China, that's cap get captured in, uh, in our database. So the total value uh, we capture in our database is something like $66 trillion, uh, which is about 59% of the national consumption or about 22% of GDP. We're unaware of any other data set available that can do better than what we, uh, what we do here. So at the end of the day, we have like 2.7 billion cards in 2015. Massive data set, uh, what we end up using in this paper is 1% random car sample, although uh, we have run it with 100% uh, sample and the results are just very similar. Okay, so this is basically showing you that we're capturing a big share of uh, total uh, consumption over time. All right, so the left-hand side, we have outdoor activity measured by uh, car transactions. On the right-hand side, we, have, we, we need pollution. How do we get pollution? The pollution data is from the aerosol optical depth from NASA's moderate resolution imaging spectroradiometer or the MODIS algorithm. It's measuring aerosol concentrations, uh, things like sulfates and black carbons, uh, you, know, you know, these like particles in the air column corresponding to 10 by 10 kilometer ground area. Right? So when a satellite passes over, passes a location, it looks at the entire column of air it infers by the reflection and absorption of sunlight how much aerosol is captured in that kind of column of air. And we're gonna use that to proxy for particular matter pollution. Right. So we aggregate that data to the city weekly level. So for each city and week, we observe sort of the proxy for particular pollution. Uh, and why do we use that instead of monitoring data? Uh, again, we don't have monitoring data before governments start to monitor them. The key advantage of the satellite data is it's available both before and after mounting data. And uh, we're gonna use that throughout, uh, throughout our, analysis, our analysis. All right, so this is just showing you the data that actually have signal. The left one is just taken directly from a job market paper. So the y-axis are uh, PM 2.5, the you know, particulate pollution at the ground level. On the axis, x-axis are modus like satellite data sets, uh, measures of particulates um, when the satellites overpasses the monitor, all right? And this is basically showing you the bin scatter. You uh, cut all the uh, uh, satellite data into 100 bins, and for each bin, you plot the average of the PM2.5 on the ground. It's a strong correlation. On the right-hand side, we replicate that for China. For the post-monitoring period, we found uh, also a very strong kind of relationship between the two. Okay. So here is the, the, the first main graph I'm gonna show you. So I typed the, the equation on top of the slide, but basically what that is, is this is showing you the, the change in the correlation between air pollution in the city and purchase rates as what fraction of people go out to make, go outdoors and make purchases. The correlation between those two variables, of course, controlling for all the fixed effects and stuff as function of time relative to the city begins monitoring, all right? So the minus sort of uh, period are periods when the cities don't have monitoring data and the positive kind of quarter scenes monitoring like the positive period, uh, event time periods are the correlation when a city starts to, to have data. Okay, so what you can see here is that the correlation between pollution and outdoor purchases are nearly zero. So like pollution variation does not appear to predict outdoor activities until the city starts to uh, broadcasting data, that's where you start to see that uh, a negative relationship between pollution and outdoor activities. Right? So when the pollution increases, people reduce outdoor activities, but only do so after they start to have the information. Right? So what is the beta estimate I kind of talked about earlier? The beta estimate is just the difference between this before line versus the after, the before average minus the after average, right? So that's the effect of the information policy. So, so Eric, yeah. one more question. So like for after uh, since monitoring, do you have longer, you have big, uh, more data? No, so uh, unfortunately what we have is until December, 2014 or it's April, 2014. So, so we don't have longer data to have like a uh, longer period. So I'm showing you the balance panel of eight quarters before and four quarters after, and that's the longest we can show you. No, I'm just curious, so is there any like fatigue? Yeah, so it, it could be possible. <laughs> like after a while, you're like, you know, 
it doesn't worth it or something like that. But I'm, I am going to show you that for the mortality data, we actually have until December 2016, which allows me to show you eight quarters uh, after the, uh, the policy. And it actually uh, turns out that the mortality effects takes time to show up. And the largest decline is, uh, is actually after a year. So it does seem, appears to be like people are still kind of avoiding after a whole year, uh, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna show you a lot of this type of pictures, uh, but just changing uh, Y uh, outcome. But here's the table estimates of, of what I showed you earlier. Uh, so what I wanted to focus on, so this is basically regressing the outcome variable, which is outdoor activities on pollution and pollution interactive with after monitoring, controlling for city fixed effects, uh, week of year and year fixed effects. And then I change uh, sort of, I increasingly uh, add sort of stringency to the fixed effects controls uh, through like column one through four, right? So the key parameter, the beta parameter is this log pollution interact with, you know, uh, indicator after monitoring coefficient. And the way to interpret that coefficient is uh, approximately after the monitoring, the elasticity of um, the pollution at purchase increased something uh, by 2% or something like that, relative to the average level of uh, purchase, which is 860 transactions per week per 10,000 cards. Okay. All right, so that's just a numerical way to summarize the figures. Uh, and we have other like supportive evidence that we think is really, uh, this is about avoidance. So we found that an increase in avoidance concentrated in deferrable transactions. So for each transaction, we can see uh, what type of merchants they go to. Do they go to supermarket, dining outs, and parks and movie centers? We think of these things as things that you can kind of defer, right? So we can wait a, a week or two to, to do. And we think these type of consumptions are more likely to subject to avoidance. And actually in the data, we found that uh, the entire effects are driven, uh, almost entirely driven by these categories, deferrable categories, whereas all other uh, categories, we don't see a significant changes after monitoring, right? So if you wanna go out and pay the bill, you have to go anyway. Okay, so uh, given the time frame, I'm gonna skip this effect size discussion. Uh, this just telling you the effect size we found is not crazy. Uh, and there are robustness checks that you can, you can uh, look at in the paper. So I'm gonna talk about the second part of the, uh, the analysis, which is if you think about outdoor activity as like a day-to-day -day short run kind of avoidance, uh, there's a literature in the economics that also talks about the long run avoidance, which is think about um, how do people choose between like dirty versus clean locations for, for residents, right? So we're gonna take that uh, literature, but again, rather than estimating the degree of capitalization, you know, how pollution gets capitalized into housing prices, we're gonna look at how does that relationship change before versus after people start to have information, right? So uh, the data we have, now we only have city for uh, data for one city, which is Beijing, uh, and Beijing starts to monitor in January, 2013. But luckily we have like transaction level data. We have all new home transactions in Beijing from 2006 to 2014. About 0.6 million transactions. We see price, apartment characteristics. Um, and one limitation is we only see new homes, which is about 40% of all, ha all housing transactions. Uh, and we are happy uh, with that. So again, I won't talk uh, about, walk you through the, the equations like uh, again, but this is basically what I showed you earlier. We're gonna regress uh, index for housing prices adjusted for apartment characteristic or how large it is, which floor it is on. And we're gonna uh, regress that kind of hedonic adjusted um, privacy index on pollution and pollution interactive with post policy. And in the case of Beijing, it's just like post 2013. So I'm gonna say that in a paper we show, uh, what we do is that we show, we uh, use two different types of measures for pollution for supplementary analysis. One is that we look at satellite uh, at the uh, apartment level and two is that we use distance from the apartment to the nearest major polluters. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm gonna only talk about exercise two, which is uh, we are gonna uh, look at all the big polluters in Beijing. Right, so uh, we have industry like facility data and we focus on top 10% of the polluters, which is about 41 of them. 
that in total account for almost 90% of total emissions in Beijing. So these are really big facilities. Uh, and these are the locations. This, this is a map of Beijing. And the triangles here are the facilities. And we have the, uh, the location of the housing transactions. And the question we're asking here is if you think about the relationship between how close you are to uh, the polluters and the housing price, how does that kind of slope right, change before versus after people start to have information? Right? So before 2013, you might think it's okay you, that you live like two miles away from a chimney. Now you think it's not okay, this type of thing. Now, again, this is the same picture. Unfortunately, now I only have like data for 2013 and a four month of 2014. So I can only show you one uh, year of post trend. But basically what I'm showing you is that the, the correlation between uh, distance, proximity to, to, uh, to polluters and housing prices also jump towards the negative direction by about 0 0.10, uh, 0 0.10 percentage points, 10 percentage points. Okay, so after pollution uh, information campaign or this program, uh, housing prices are more responsive to pollution variations uh, after, uh, after this information campaign. And again, we discussed effect size, showing you this is not crazy. Uh, and I hope like I can jump into the final part uh, of, the, of the analysis, which is looking at health damage. Um, Okay, so this is the end point of analysis, which we think is also the most important. We talk about avoidance uh, in both in the short term and the long term, and but we don't directly care about avoidance. We care about people's health, right? So the ultimate reason that we control pollution is we hope less people can die or suffer from disease burdens from those uh, shocks. There's a huge literature in uh, environment economics that estimate the, the effect of pollution on mortality, which is a extreme but very important outcome for, for health. So here what we do is again, we test for uh, the change in the relationship between mortality and pollution before versus after city having uh, have, uh, broadcast pollution data. And the mortality data is uh, we have city by weekly level mortality rate for 131 cities in China from January 2011 to December 2016. The data is from the China CDC uh, the disease surveillance point system. So our data covers about 73 million people, uh, which uh, is about 5% of, uh, of representative sample of, of population. So here is the same figure I showed you uh, earlier, but then I'm replacing the outcome to log mortality level. Uh, so again, because we have like longer data, I can show you the longer, longer sort of post period. We can see here again, it's kind of a flattened stable mortality and pollution sort of gradient, which starts to drop after uh, cities begin to, to have data, right? So um, what I'm gonna say here is that what it, the interpretation is for the same amount of pollution increases, the response uh, of mortality becomes weaker before versus after, right? So in this case, we see about 3.2% reduction uh, in the harm basically of pollution uh, of, of health harm done by pollution uh, exposure. Okay, um, what we do, uh, we also look at different causes of death. We found that you know, cardio and respiratory death, which is uh, conventionally thought of as linked to, to, to health, accounts for over 50% of all the effects we found, which is good. We don't find effects like injuries, which we think of it as a placebo test uh, that doesn't show up, which is good. We see larger effects in urban areas, you know, uh, places with more hospital access, uh, more electricity usage, higher mobile phone penetration. Um, and also we found exact uh, heterogeneity patterns for outdoor spending, right? So if the city reduced outdoor spending more uh, in response to the information program, we see a larger mortality benefits as well, which we think makes a lot of sense. All right, so the punchline uh, of, the, of the paper is that we apply a kind of a back of envelope uh, VSL calculation. Uh, we show the mortality benefit of this program is about $73.3 billion per year. Uh, that's something about 150,000 uh, deaths for age 60 plus uh, for the entire China. Entire China. Um, and um, what we do is that we also look at uh, mortality benefit, which is um, about 48.8 .8 billion. 
per year. Uh, and relative to, sorry, sorry, we look at morbidity benefit, which is uh, about two uh, thirds of the mortality benefits. Uh, we took that number directly from the, uh, the literature that looks at like things like medical spending. And the end of the day, uh, we're gonna point out that the, the avoidance cost itself, things like uh, max, mask purchasing and like air purified purchasings, uh, or things like foregone consumer surplus because you're not spending that much, is uh, we calculate, to be, calculate that to be something around $12 billion per year, which we think is, is much smaller than, uh, than the mortality benefit and morbidity benefit of the program. Okay, uh, I'm a little over time, but let me uh, conclude the paper. So we uh, think we're the first comprehensive analysis of a national white pollution monitoring disclosure program. We show that information is a key determinant of avoidance behavior, uh, leading to a cascade of behavioral changes. Uh, behavioral changes in turn mitigate health damages. And in uh, at the end of the day, we conclude that the information program is a Kind of low cost environmental regulation uh, and an important lesson for other emerging and uh, developing countries. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Eric, for your uh, great presentation. So um, do we have any other questions from the audience? So we have some colleagues that left early, so this is like Friday, so they may have other yeah. meetings to go. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, just, um, uh, just, just again, just circle back uh, some of my question. But the but certainly this uh, this uh, carefully are uh, um, uh, um, executed uh, paper. So you guys did uh, tons of work. It's very mm -hmm. convincing and very very interesting, very important. I guess all right. So a um, couple of uh, minor things. Number one. So it seems like so now I understand. So you basically you are more focused on the behavior change on consumer side. Mm -hmm. Right, and then so, but then so you you focus on. I mean, there are like two minor things. I don't know so whether you have uh, do some like a control or not. So mm -hmm. you look at Apple, and it. I mean, when I say Apple, essentially it's like the the iPhone like yeah, yeah, yeah. App store. Right? This is number one. Number two, you look at Union Pay, right? And the re we, the reason why I bring up these two issue is so you may have kind of biased a sample in the sense whoever use apple you know whoever use union pay they probably relatively speaking so they are higher income better educated so in that sense the impact on them is going to be stronger so but i understand so yeah so if we look at look at them you find out these results that's already um, already, uh, already uh, interesting funding, but somehow, so you may want to. Yeah, exactly. I, I, get, I totally get you what you're saying. Like we're getting at, for example, the union pay analysis, we're getting at the people who actually have the credit card, uh, right. the credit card they use right. it. Right. Uh, that could be very different from like the rural population right. where they don't have it. Right. right. We actually found it. We um, inferred both like card analysis and the mortality analysis. We look at things like income, like urbanization, and things like mobile phone penetration, right? So if 70% of people have mobile phone versus like 90% of people have mobile phone. Um, so we don't have like individual heterogeneity, but we have like city level, we can look at high versus low penetration. Okay. It turns out that, yeah, so places with higher mobile penetration has a larger benefit, which I think in itself is useful because like it tells you not only you need a program, but also you need uh, you need mobile phones to, to reach uh, to reach people. Right. right. Uh, in terms of consumption, right. So we don't we don't capture like a um, hundred percent of the people in terms of like outdoor activities, but we do capture like sixty percent of total consumption in the national uh, sense. Right. That's the best we can do. Um, right. No, no, I, I, understand. I understand. So so far, this is already very uh, formidable formidable uh, task to do because you have tons of. Uh, empirical challenge you have to face. Yeah. yeah. The other other things is, uh, so you, I mean, so when you say uh, the mortality, so like uh, the elasticity or whatever, so the, the or the derivative of mortality um, with respect to pollution, 
Here's my guess, may mm -hmm. not be true. So, or only this is only my hypothesis. So, this information uh, improvement may somehow is going to change change the industry policy. What I'm saying is, uh, as a response, those polluters or those uh, uh, companies, they were forced to to in some sense to change their pollution um, emission to make the pollution itself less deadly. Yeah. Or in other words, maybe, okay, so maybe put it another way. So overall, there is like, uh, there is a decline, declining trend in terms of pollution. I mean, how deadly the pollution can be. So maybe what we are capturing is just, think about it in the margin, right? So you have maybe, so let me say, okay, so just put it under the way. So just think about, so uh, you have the, the mortality uh, cause as yeah. a function of a pollution. So this is probably like a, a convex function. So now, so you are just going to capture the highest portion. No, I, I totally get you what you're saying. So it's like, okay. so yeah. we're controlling for concentration. So it's like, uh, but your concern would be valid if you have, like before and after we show actually you have the same concentration of the level of pollution. Wait a second. So I'm not, so this is not necessarily a concern or this is not necessarily criticism than to your paper. Yeah, yeah, I know it is, but, but, I, but I get you, yeah. Yeah, this just says, so maybe something, so, but again, so you guys are very smart, so way smarter than me. So no, you no, I, thought I, about that. Yeah, you probably thought totally, about that. Yeah, I actually think it's important, like even if you don't have like a concentration change, right? So it's still like 60, but then you might have industries that change like the, the you know, the com composite of what they're emitting, right? So they transfer, like they um, move from like coal to gas, but they burn more gas or like they, they just change the, um, change the composition of how toxic right. the pollution right, is. Right, right, right. Then you might, that could be the channel, but like. No, uh, so yeah, so yeah. let me just, uh, just uh, give, let me just tell you a little bit of bigger picture. So what I was thinking. So yeah. again, so I'm coming from macro, right? So I may, I may always <laughs> think in the macro perspective. Yeah. And particularly, so we show all the picture, like, so the slides regarding to the, the, the social cause, the social benefit. Right. What I was thinking is, so maybe there's interesting uh, under, under, under the surface, there may be a very interesting two function. Function number one, the awareness of the uh, households as a function of information is going to be a declining function. And the other function is, so the, the deadliness or the benefit of reducing the pollution as a function of uh, information, uh, Let's see. Yeah, it's declining. Mm -hmm. So, so you see what I'm saying. So, so yes. Once you once you put more effort and the awareness of the households, the benefit from the awareness of the households okay. start to decline. On the other hand, so the the benefit by reducing the mortality is going to decline as well. Okay. okay. Why is it because people get fatigue, right? Like in the US, yeah. people get fatigue. The other is because like a technology, right? So essentially, so just think about like, so in the, in the macro, we have this uh, decrease in marginal return, right? So in some sense, okay, so toward the end, so you, in order to put you to the, fr to the frontier of your production, so you really need to put, pollute a lot. That's, that's, that's when you close the frontier. Right, right, but if you are inside the frontier, so in terms of production, so yeah. your pollution is going, you see what I'm saying, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's more like a short run thing, right? So like in the short run, you might have like a very strong reaction, but then right. over time, I, right. if I treat you with the same information, right. you might not be as attentive to right, what, you know, right. How both from, like yeah. It. So both from supply side and and the uh, demand side is going to squeeze you. Yeah, squeeze you in. But yeah. So again, so this is just uh, for sure. This is not a criticism. I just just these are like brainstorm. So yeah, yeah. No, I think these are important. Yeah, yeah, I think this like this program is relatively new to China. Like everybody is using app, but it'll be interesting to to know like information fatigue as a general topic because like right. we get warnings and things like all the time, right? So we look at COVID numbers. After three months, we're like, you know what, the, right? So it's right. like all of a sudden, a thousand seems like just a thousand. Okay. Yeah. So, 
yeah. so I guess I, I, we should stop here. So it seems like everybody I got. Okay. okay. Just, yeah. uh, just stop the recording. Thanks. Okay. Oh yeah, thank you again. Thanks, thanks. <laughs>